Good morning again. Uh, welcome to NDC London, the first uh, session after the keynote. Um, my name is uh, Johnny Hoybergs, uh, and today I will uh, talk about uh, Microsoft Q-Sharp and a little bit about Azure Quantum. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, a bit of a special talk. Um, so, again, welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining um, in the morning. Um, unfortunately, we're still doing this virtually. Um, and it's a little bit awkward for me as a speaker because I can only see a couple of you. I can't see everyone. I can't see your reactions. So because of that, I am trying to make this presentation a little bit more um, interactive. So that's why I've set up uh, a Slido um, page specifically for this session. So you are able to join using this QR code. Uh, you can use your smartphone. Uh, you can also visit the website slido.com and use the QSharp hashtag to join this session. What is this session all about or this Slido session? Uh, well, basically you can ask me questions um, during my presentation and I will do my best to answer those questions during the presentation because um, I think it's better to answer questions when they uh, are first asked. Um, and then, of course, I, I, when I'm not able to answer all of those questions, I will uh, answer uh, the rest of them after the presentation or even the, in, during the rest of the day. You can always find me in, um, in the Slack. Uh, you can talk to me in Slack and I will uh, happily answer your questions. I also have some questions for you, uh, the audience, so that I know what to expect today. So. Go ahead and and, and, uh, and use this Slido to join. Um, and I, I'm already going to ask you um, a single question that can give me an idea of, of why you guys are, 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 are joining um, this session. So yeah, what made you join this session? Please just uh, let me know. Um, and while you are answering this question, I am going to introduce uh, myself. So again, my name is uh, Johnny Hoybergs. I am uh, I'm a developer and a consultant, um, and I live in Belgium. I work for a consultancy firm, and I visit customers to help them um, creating software applications. I am actually a .NET developer uh, and architect, um, so I'm not really doing any, any quantum. Um, I am a Microsoft MVP um, for developer technologies. Um, you can always contact me on Twitter. Uh, I have a GitHub, and everything that I'm showing you today is also on my GitHub page, including the slides uh, and the presentation. If you have any more burning questions after today, again, I will be on Slack today. Um, but if you have uh, questions tomorrow or next week, don't hesitate to contact me uh, at my company email address, johnny.hoybergs at involvedit.be. Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a .NET developer. So why the hell am I talking about uh, quantum computing then? Well, basically, I was in your uh, I was in your location a couple of, of uh, years ago. I was uh, visiting a conference and somebody was talking about quantum computing and Microsoft Q Sharp specifically. Um, and actually, it, it was quite hard for me to follow because I did not really have a, a, a good mathematical background. I didn't really know anything about quantum physics, um, so it was interesting. I was interested. It was very interesting, uh, but I left the session and I only understood about. 15 or 20% of the content. So that is when I decided to dig a little deeper myself. Um, and from one thing came another, and now I'm, I'm trying to do the same presentation uh, uh, for you guys and hopefully do a better job and hopefully make you understand um, at least more than 15 or 20% um, of this presentation. So if I go back to Slido, I can see that uh, a couple of you are here out of curiosity. Um, uh, actually, uh, lots of you are here uh, for curiosity. Somebody's here for the speaker. Uh, thank you. Um, somebody also said tr they tried reading up on quantum computing before. Dot dot dot, which probably means that yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of things involved, and it's quite hard to know where to start. Uh, I can I can relate to that. And there's also people here for professional and academic interests. So perfect, very cool. Um, next question for this session, um, I'm not going to ask a, a question every minute or so, but I'm going to start with this uh, question. Basically, because we're not too many people um, and I want to see 
what do you want the focus of this session to be? Because I've already did this presentation a couple of times and I can do it uh, in, in multiple different ways. Um, do you want me to spend time on explaining quantum computing, the theory about that, and then show you some Q-sharp code to back it? Um, or do you want me to spend more time on live coding using Q-sharp and explain um, using Q-sharp and then a little bit of theory about the quantum concepts? Do you just want your mind blown or don't, don't you really care? So I will keep this question open and I will continue my presentation. And then in five minutes, I will look and I will base the rest of my presentation on your responses. So why quantum computing? Well, basically, when we look at classical computers um, and we build algorithms on classical computers, today we still have problems. We still have um, questions that are actually too hard to solve by a classical computer and that it's it's very hard to comprehend because yeah a, a classical computer today a modern classical computer they are very powerful they can do lots of things and we have the power of the cloud we can put classical computers in parallel and make them solve our problems uh, very fast well i got first introduced to these um difficult problems when i was in high school and one of my teachers asked me um I want to I want to challenge you. He told me. He said, "I know you're into programming." Uh, back then, when I was a teenager, I was doing some programming in uh, Turbo Pascal. Um, he said, "I know you're into programming, so I have a little problem for you. And this problem is called the Knight's Tour. So when you have a chessboard and you have a, a knight piece, um, a knight piece can do a very specific jump, which is called a horse jump, um, and it can jump from the location on, in the picture on the left hand side to eight different spots." And a teacher told me, just start at a, at a regular uh, tile and then keep jumping around. And you should actually visit each square on the board just once. Uh, and you will be able to, to visit all of the squares uh, on the board. So I thought, yeah, that's a, a pretty a simple example. We have 64, uh, a simple problem. We have 64 squares in total. I'm just going to write a brute force algorithm that tries to jump around until it locks, uh, until it's stuck. If it can't go any directions, it will backtrack and it will try another route. I thought this will be fine. So I wrote the program. Uh, my, my computer in that day took a couple of hours and didn't reach a solution yet. So I thought I made a mistake. So I looked at the code. I ran it again. I uh, didn't fi find a solution. I even I ran it for an entire night. And in the morning, it still not, didn't found a solution. And by then, uh, I was a teenager. I was also doing other things. I was playing outside. Um, so I just bailed on this problem. So I thought I made a mistake. I'm too stupid for this. Um, whatever. Only later, I, uh, I got introduced to this problem again uh, called the Knight's Tour. And it seems that it's actually when you make the wrong decision. So when you make the wrong jumps into the wrong directions, this is actually a very difficult problem to solve for a classical computer because there are so many options. There are so many options that even a classical computer can take uh, multiple years to solve this problem. If you, however, by accident take the, the right decisions, the algorithm can be uh, solved very quickly. But of course, you don't know what is the right decision and what is the wrong decision. So a problem like this is an example of problems that are actually too difficult to solve on a classical computer. And hopefully quantum computers um, will help us to, by, by using a different way of thinking, by um, doing things in parallel, and I will get, go deeper uh, into that uh, in, a, in just a few minutes. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to solve these kinds of problems in a manner of minutes instead of years. Um, another very cool example of these problems that become dif uh, difficult very quickly over time is something very simple. Like if you take uh, a piece of paper and I need to find a piece of paper for you. Uh, if you take a, a regular piece of paper like this, it's a uh, 0.1 millimeter in thickness. And if you fold it double, it becomes 0.2 millimeter in thickness. Now, apparently when you do this 42 times, 42, it, it's a small number 42. Uh, you're not able to fold it 42 times because then it becomes too difficult. But in theory, when you fold it 42 times, the 0.1 millimeters becomes 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and this will continue for 42 times. Um, and the total thickness of your piece of paper will actually reach half a million kilometers. 
half a million kilometers. That's the distance. That's more than the distance between Earth and the moon. And you only fold the piece of paper 42 times. That is crazy. And this is what we call an exponential problem. We do something over and over again, and then the solution to that problem becomes uh, exponential in nature. So quantum computing is actually based on quantum physics. And because of uh, a couple of phenomena in quantum physics, we hope that quantum computing can solve these kind of exponential problems because quantum in nature is exponential by nature. Um, so these two pheno phenomena that we can use for quantum computer computers are called superposition and entanglement. These are the, the two most important ones. Um, there's an image on the left hand side and it tries to show you the, the concept of superposition. Basically, on a very small scale in our natural world, um, an object can have a property and this property can be in some kind of state. Um, if you, for example, take an electron, an electron has a property which is called the spin of that electron. And we would like, uh, we like to say that the spin of an electron can be spin up or spin down. So two discrete values, uh, up or down, which basically is a binary thing. Uh, it can be zero or one represented by spin up or spin down. Now, superposition means that this property can be in a state of superposition and be the spin up and the spin down at the same time. When I say at the same time, that's not entirely correct. Basically, it just didn't yet make a decision. It's somewhere in between um, and it will make a decision after some time, and that decision is based on probability. So when uh, a spin of an electron is in superposition, for example, it can be a 50% spin up and a 50% spin down until it makes a decision, and then that decision will uh, collapse into the actual spin up or spin down based on that uh, probability, which is very cool. Um, of course, this only works on a very small scale, uh, so mac uh, microscopical objects. In our current world, um, these behaviors, they don't emerge. Uh, we don't see things like this happening in our real world. And that's why it's a little bit weird to us. But on a microscopical level, it actually exists and it's been proven by scientists on many, many, many occasions. Um, the only thing that, that I can think of um, is basically a USB uh, slot. If you try to put a USB key in your computer um, and you, you flip it around uh, multiple times, it will never fit because it's in a state of superposition. Um, and then very importantly, uh, a state of superposition collapses or makes a decision when you observe it. So when it comes into touch with reality. So you really have to look at your ES USB um, slot, then you can see the orientation, then it collapses to that orientation, and then you are able to, to uh, put your USB key. So that's uh, an, an, an analogy of what is happening on a microscopical level. And then the image on the right-hand side shows the concept of entanglement. Basically, we can have two microscopical objects, for example, two uh, electrons, and they can be in some kind of entangled state, which means if both are in superposition and they are entangled, if we observe just one of those particles, um, it will make a decision and it will uh, collapse to either spin up or spin down. And then the other entangled particle will do the exact uh, opposite thing. So if, if, if we look at the left, uh, electron and it decides on a spin up, the right electron will at that moment in time decide on a spin down, the exact opposite. Um, because somehow these particles are entangled. Scientists know that it works because they have done experiments on multiple occasions and it always works. They are When they are entangled, they will always be opposite states when you observe either one of them. Um, but we don't really know how it works because there is no communication between those particles. Somehow they are one, but they can be very far apart and it still works. So you can actually put one uh, particle on Earth and another particle in space, um, and they will still collapse at the same time when you only observe one. So very spooky things are happening here and we don't really know why. But this is again something that we can use to our advantage when we talk about computing. So very quickly, what are specific use cases for quantum computing? Well use cases where we have problems that are too complex to solve because of their exponent, exponential nature. For example, security. Today, our public-private key encryption is based on factorization of large, uh, factorization of large prime, uh, I'm sorry, prime factorization of large numbers, which means that 
when you have a public or a private key. Um, a private key can be, for example, two prime numbers and a public key can be those prime numbers multiplied together, which means that you can share your public key with everyone and they can use that public key to encrypt data. But you are the only one that has the private key, so the two separate prime numbers, um, and you need those numbers to decrypt some information. This security principle is based upon the fact that when you have the public key, you are not able to distill the original two prime numbers from that because you need a brute force algorithm that tries to multiply prime numbers together until you by accident reach those two prime numbers that originally made um, your larger number. But if you have those two prime numbers, the public key, you can very easily, uh, the private key, you can very easily create a public key from that. Um, hopefully with quantum computers, or at least we're a little bit afraid of that also with quantum computers, we will be able to solve um, that problem. We will be able to factorize large integers into their original prime factors. Um, the algorithm already exists and it works on very small numbers um, today. We don't have the physical hardware, the physical quantum hardware um, that is capable of doing it on very large numbers. So today we are safe security wise, but hopefully we will be able to create powerful quantum computers in the future that are able to, to crack this. And then of course we need to find another um, problem that is even too difficult to solve for a quantum uh, computer. Uh, another example is drug development, for example. Drug development today is very difficult because when you create a drug, that drug needs to interact with the, the tiny particles inside of your body. Uh, so you need to create something and then you need to know, okay, how is this going to respond to the individual molecules inside of my body? Um, this is something you could try to, um, to simulate on a classical computer. Um, but of course, there are billions and billions of, of, of uh, molecules inside of your body. And it's, it, it's just, there's too many interactions. So it's really an exponential problem here. So it's very difficult for a classical computer to simulate all of those interactions on billions and billions of, of, of molecules and even atoms and, and electrons. Um, so yeah, today we, we only do a very small part of that, a very, uh, very uh, high level simulation. And that's also the reason why we do drug um, tests on animals, for example, because we just don't know, we can't simulate what a drug will actually do uh, in real life. So hopefully when a quantum computer, computer brings us this um, extreme powerful, um, uh, this extreme power, we are able to do these uh, simulations. And also it makes sense, your body works quantum. Everything is quantum by nature inside of your body. So when you want to simulate something like that, when you simulate it on quantum hardware, it's going to be much closer to reality. So hopefully that will bring us uh, lots of new answers to our questions. And then finally, the same story for machine learning. Machine learning is about large quantities of data and we want fast feedback. Uh, so we, when you have large quantities of data and you want to calculate, um, interactions between those 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 data uh, entities um, that can take a long time and if you if you really want uh, fast feedback in your artificial intelligence um, hopefully quantum computing can also help us with that so let's go back to slido and see what you guys um, decided so okay mo most of you want want more time on theory and a little bit less time on q sharp um, but also some of you want to see some some q sharp so i'm going to do a, a combination i will try to explain lots of things but i will also show you code um, and i will i will not do any live coding then um, but i will show you the code that i've prepared beforehand and i will go through that code step by step very cool thank you and of course um, if there are questions you can always uh, use Slido to ask those questions. So somebody says stupid question. Um, let's see if it's stupid. Can't you use a shortest path algorithm for the Knight's problem thingy? Yeah, um, I was a bit, uh, I was a bit quick with that, but I just wanted to use it. If you brute force, um, if you brute force that thing, um, then it, it just takes years and years and years if you make the wrong decisions. That's the, that's the idea, just, just random, randomly choose uh, directions and if you are uh, if you are not lucky and make the wrong decisions then it can really take a long time um shortest path shortest shortest path i never tried it so i'm not sure if that's going to be uh, a solution to that problem but maybe it is there are many solutions to that problem 
Uh, and I know because I tried it uh, a couple of months ago myself, um, if you use a very specific algorithm to solve that, it, it can be solved in milliseconds. Um, but the story that I want to, wanted to tell was that, yeah, if you make the wrong decisions, it seems for our, for in our head, it seems a very easy problem to solve because you only have 64 squares. But of course, when you make the wrong decision and you need to backtrack and you try again, um, that is, that is just too many different, uh, opportunities, um, to solve. So that's, that's a crazy thing. So let's get back to the slides. Now, I tried to tell you what quantum computing can do for us, but the most important question, of course, is can we use quantum computer to run a game like Crisis? Um, the story that I want to tell with this is that a quantum computer is going to be something very different than a classical computer. A quantum computer will actually only be able to solve very specific problems. So when we have an exponential problem, um, we can't just use the same algorithm and run that on a quantum computer and hope it will be quicker. No, we have to be very smart about these concepts of superposition and entanglement. We need to be smart. We need to create an entirely new algorithm that works in a completely different way and tries to tackle our problems in a completely different way. Um, so a quantum computer will be powerful for a very specific use case, but when we want to, to run like classical things like a computer game, for example, we will still need to do that on a classical computer. A quantum computer is also going to be, uh, or at least today is, is very expensive to run because we basically need physical quantum particles and we need to manipulate those physical quantum particles and they are so small. So it's very difficult in hardware to be able to do that. So the quantum computers that exist today, they use like a, a couple of uh, a hundred of these tiny particles. Some of them use photons, which is the elementary particle of light. Other companies use electrons. Some other companies even use other um, component, components like ions. Um, and they, they are manipulated using laser beams or using microwaves. Uh, and because particles uh, interact with our environment very quickly, they need to strip out the variable of our environment. So they need to put it inside of a vacuum. They don't, the, the particles cannot touch each other. Um, it needs to be cooled down to almost absolute zero so that there's a uh, little interaction. So it's, it's very hard to do. So, um, in theory, a quantum computer, because it also works with the binary concept of a state that can, for example, an electron can be up or down. So that's a binary state zero or one. Um, so in theory, you can actually run classical algorithms on a quantum computer, but it would just be stupid. Um, a classical computer will be uh, a lot, a lot cheaper to run those kinds of uh, problems. But if you're writing algorithms that use, that need superposition, that that are thinking smart about superposition, they need to run on a quantum computer and then they can use that power. Hopefully in the future, and when I talk about the future, I mean many decades from now, quantum hardware can be made cheaper if we find something that we can use uh, as quantum particles that don't need all of these um, very hard to reach uh, physical properties. So as I told you before, um, Basically, we're going to use the same knowledge we already have in classical computers, and we're going to translate that into quantum computers. So in a classical computer, we're talking about bits. In a quantum computer, we're talking about qubits, but we represent the same binary values. So a bit can be zero or one. Uh, we can combine multiple bits together. So we have a string of bits that can represent data. Um, in a quantum computer, we do exactly the same thing, but we use a slightly different notation. Uh, the different notation, because of course we want to make it apparent to people that we are talking quantum bits, qubits, and not regular bits. So this notation is called the Dirac notation after a scientist uh, mathematician called Paul Dirac. It's just like a vertical line, then the zero, uh, and then uh, kind of a greater than sign, but it's not really a greater than sign. It's a very specific sign to the Dirac notation um, to represent the zero state on the left-hand side and the one state on the right-hand side. Um, when we combine qubits to, to represent some kind of data, we do the same thing. We use the Dirac notation and now we know that this is a quantum state 100110. But things only become interesting and the power of quantum computer becomes apparent when we are going to put a qubit state in a super 
in superposition. And then you are actually describing a state that is a combination between the zero and the one state. So a lot of people, they are talking about zero and one at the same time, but that's actually incorrect. Basically, when a state is in superposition, it just did not yet make a decision on, is it in the zero state or is it in the one state? And it's all based on probabilities. So when a qubit is in perfect superposition, it always has a 50-50% probability of collapsing to zero or one. And the collapsing happens when that state or when the, 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 the physical object that represents this state is being observed by an observer. So when we do a measurement, like we, we, use, um, we use a tool to measure, okay, is this electrons spin up or down, for example, the moment we take the measurement, that is the moment that it makes a decision based on those probabilities. And we have a mathematical way of representing those probabilities like this. So we have uh, the direct notation for state zero on the left-hand side and the direct notation for the state one on the right-hand side. And then we use two values called alpha and beta in this case, and they represent that probability. And we just make it in, into a linear combination, which is a, a linear algebra kind of thingy. So there's a linear combination between the zero state and the one state. Um, to make that work mathematically, um, there's like a formula that says the absolute value of your alpha value uh, squared plus the absolute value of your beta value squared needs to be equal one, because this one value represents a 100% chance of doing anything. So there's a 100% chance of doing anything. And then the linear combination between these alpha and beta that's able to uh, shift these probabilities more to the alpha side or more, more to the beta side. And when you add those together, you always have a 100 uh, probability. Um, and then to make the math uh, work even harder, alpha and beta are actually complex numbers. So a complex number is, is, is something different than a real number. It's a combination between a real number and an imaginary number. So there's I. Uh, the, so when you know i, if you know complex numbers, i squared equals minus one. Um, basically, if we if we try to create an algorithm in quantum computing, we need to be good at math, or we need to know about some linear algebra. We need to know about complex numbers because we need to be, think smart, and we need to make sure that we can use values that are to our advantage. And that is why we need complex number to make numbers to make this work. I don't have time to explain this into much details. Uh, you, you really have to do that investigation by yourself. I did it by myself. I spent a little bit more than a summer. Um, I bought some books uh, and it's actually quite simple. Um, I know math seems very uh, frightening when you're not into it, but basically it's just a tool that we need to use to understand all of these concepts. Um, and the tool is quite simple. Uh, if If you just learn a little bit about complex numbers and linear algebra, you will understand everything that happens uh, in quantum computing. Um, so please don't be afraid. I was afraid, but today I'm actually very happy that it exists. So basically when you look at those formulas um, and you want to represent a 50-50% superposition, you need those alpha and beta numbers to be one over square root of two, because you need to take the absolute value and then square that. So 1 over square root of 2 squared is actually 1 squared over square root of 2 squared, which is 1 over 2, which is a half. So it's a half uh, times the 0 state plus a half times the 1 state, totally equaling to 1, which is 50-50 and 100%. So to recap this theory before we go into uh, some uh, Q-sharp, there's the classical bit 0 and there's the quantum bit 0. Um, the notation is a little bit different, but the concept is the same. Um, but it's the same binary logic. So we can reuse the knowledge we already have from binary logic um, into quantum computing. Then if you put up a, a quantum bit in superposition, things become more difficult. Now you need some mathematics. These alpha and beta values will represent um, the probabilities of the superposition collapsing to either the zero or the one state. Um, those are complex numbers. And of course, collapsing only happens when you do a measurement. Um, I just want to show you this. Um, some people are against this. Uh, some people are uh, uh, like this. This is actually a, a visual representation of a quantum state um, because it's very hard to think about a quantum state in mathematics. Um, it's very hard if, if you if you have a visual mind, it's it's a lot easier to to 
uh, convert this linear algebra into like a vector in uh, some kind of uh, vector space uh, and then visually represent that. So that's why uh, this thing exists. This thing, if you Google it, it's called a block sphere, block B-L-O-C-H. Um, and it represents a vector that actually represents the, 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 the state of uh, a quantum bit. So basically it's in, it's in uh, three dimensions um, because we are using complex numbers for both alpha and beta. And if we, if we convert that into a vector, um, we basically have two uh, complex numbers, which is already a vector in two dimensional space. If we combine those, we have uh, one vector in three dimensional space. Um, and it's, it's quite simple. Uh, if you look at the Z axis, which is the axis that goes from top to bottom, um, this actually represents the axis for the states zero and one, where the zero state is up and the one state is down. Um, so if your vector is pointing all the way up, you're actually in state zero, 100%. So you're, you're just in state zero. If your vector points all the way down, you're in state uh, one. And then everything in between, so your, your vector can actually be everywhere inside of this sphere, originating in the center and, uh, and ending somewhere on the surface of the sphere. Um, this is the actual uh, one length of your probability. Um, but that vector can be everywhere. Um, and if it's not on the z-axis pointing up or on the z-axis pointing down, if it's somewhere else, it's in superposition. And basically, you can immediately see visually the probabilities of it of that vector collapsing to either zero or one. If it's closer to pointing up, then the probability of collapsing to zero is higher. If it's closer to pointing down somewhere in the in the bottom half, then it's it has a higher probability of collapsing to um, one. If that factor is somewhere on that plane uh, on the x and the y axis, um, it's actually in perfect 50-50 superposition because now it has uh, the same distance to travel towards the up position on the z axis and the same distance uh, towards the, the down position on the z axis. So then it's in, in, in perfect superposition. If you dumb it down uh, and you just take out the, the complex numbers and show it in, in a two dimensional space, um, it's a little bit easier to comprehend. So when the vector points left or right, it's in a perfect superposition, which is the one over square root of two, zero and one. Um, and you can actually also using uh, sines and cosines calculate the angle. In this case, the angle is 90 degrees. Um, so pi over two radians. Um, and based on that, you can also calculate the probabilities using the sine and the cosine. Um, and then you have like uh, the 50-50 the uh, probability. Uh, in the case on the right-hand side, this vector is actually has a two pi over three radians uh, angle, which is uh, 120 degrees. Um, and 120 degrees, as you can see, is pointing a little bit more down. Um, and if you use the sine and the cosine to calculate um, the two uh, well, actually, if I if I take my mouse pointer, uh, let's see. Sorry, if I take my mouse pointer, basically, if you do the sine and the cosine, you're calculating uh, the the this line. If you take that vertically, then you, you you're somewhere here. Um, so the projection is the word I was looking for. So th this will project somewhere here on the x axis, axis, and this vector will project here on the z axis. If you if you calculate um, those lengths, you will basically get the one over two and square root of three over two, um, which are the alpha and beta uh, values uh, for the um, 120 degrees angle. So you can see visually that it's closer to the one uh, state. So the the probability of the one state will be higher. So that is basically um, the square root three over two. If you if you square that, you have three over four. So that's a seventy five percent chance of collapsing to one. And then one over two squared is one over four. So that's a one in four or twenty five percent chance of collapsing to zero. So now you can see that visually, it's a lot easier to try to comprehend um, what the mathematics behind all of this means. So let's just go to Q sharp and 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 show you some examples of what the hell is going on. So. Uh, where's my Q sharp? Here it is. So Q sharp is a is a programming language from uh, from Microsoft. 
Um, and they actually created the programming language before quantum computing was actually like a thing that was already working. We were, we will, we were already discussing quantum computing, but Microsoft did, did not yet have a quantum computer to, to, to run some uh, algorithms, but they decided to already make uh, a programming languages, a programming language called Q-sharp. The reason for this is become quantum because quantum computing actually already exists since the nineties. Um, in the late 80s, begin 90s, lots, lots of computer scientists were already uh, thinking about these, um, these solutions uh, and popular quantum algorithms, for, for example, the algorithm that is able to factorize um, large numbers into their prime factors. It already exists since the 90s, but we just don't have the hardware to run it. But in theory, it works. So Microsoft decided, let's get ahead of the game. Let's create a programming language that already uses everything that we have um, theorized for the uh, last decades, so since the late 80s, begin 90s. Um, let's put that into a programming language and let's make that programming language um, so that we would be able to, to use it on an actual quantum computer when those quantum computers exist. So today, when you download Q Sharp or the Quantum Development Kit, as Microsoft likes to call it, um, you basically download the programming language Q Sharp, but you also download an SDK that is based on .NET that is able to run your quantum, quantum algorithm on your local PC in a simulated environment. This means that you are only able to run very simple problems because of course, the more qubits you allocate, the more difficult um, your quantum states becomes. Because if you have like a combined entangled state of multiple uh, 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 qubits, if they are all in a one state, that's just a binary thing that's very easy to store. But if they're if they are all in a superposition state and they are entangled together, you basically have to describe that in a mathematical way um, by using all of these alpha and beta numbers. But if you have like the combination of all of these qubits, you have a lot, lot of these um, probabilities. For example, if you take two qubits and you put them in equal superposition, you now have uh, a 25% of those two qubits collapsing to um, either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, uh, 0, 0. So that's four different states. If you add a single qubit to that, a third qubit, you now have eight states. Another qubit will make it 16 states. So basically with every qubit you add, the probabilities will divide amongst double the amount of state. Um, so adding a single qubit will double the amount of state, um, which is exponential. So on your local PC, when you just add one qubit to your algorithm, when you allocate one more qubit to your, uh, to your algorithm, you need double the amount of memory to be able to store this, the combined superposition state of those qubits. And that's the reason why we can't do these kinds of things on a classical computer. So this is cool if you want to learn about quantum or if you have very small problems um, and you want to create uh, algorithms for that. Um, but of course, when we want to solve algorithms that need, for example, 100 qubits, you can't do that on your local machine. You need to run that on an actual quantum computer. So in in Q sharp, when you want to allocate a qubit, you basically do you basically do a, a using statement like you would do in C sharp. Uh, you use you allocate a qubit to uh, a new qubit, and this is kind of a factory function. Uh, equals qubit is like a factory function that will give you a qubit and it will assign that qubit to the uh, Q value. Now now we have a qubit. By default, that qubit is in the zero state, just like a Boolean value in C-sharp by default equals the zero state. Um, so if you want to do something with that qubit, we are actually with Q-sharp and with quantum today, quantum computing today, we are the same level as like machine level on classical computers. So we need to put our bits or our qubits through some gates in order to change the value. So like in a, in a classical computer, these gates are like a not gate to flip a bit value, but we also have combined gates like an end or an or or an exclusive or gate and, and, and stuff like that. Um, so on quantum computing, we have the same things, we, but we have different kinds of gates. So for example, a qubit that is not in superposition, if you want to put a qubit in superposition, you are able to do that using the H gate, which is called the Hadamard gate. And Q sharp provides you with all of these gates and you can call a gate on top of uh, a qubit to 
basically put that qubit through that gate. So H of Q actually means put that qubit in superposition. If you do it again, you pull it out of superposition again. And in the background, there is a mathematical formula that will help you to um, convert the, the qubit state, like the alpha and beta values, to convert that into um, a superposition state. So there's like operations that can do this for you. And if you want to, to look in some detail, I have those operations um, in my slides. And those operations are basically a rotation inside of this block sphere. So you can visualize these rotations, um, these gates, they will change the state of your qubit as by pointing your vector somewhere else in, in your uh, block sphere. All of this is based on linear algebra. So you can represent uh, the state of your qubit in a matrix, and then you have a matrix that represents your operation, and you can multiply those two matrices together, uh, and then you have the solution. So you will need to do, it, to do a little bit of mathematics if you want to do it from the top of your head, or you can just use Q-sharp, um, and it will do that for you in the background. Um, I could, for example, do a measurement by using the M gate. This will measure the state of this qubit in superposition, and I can store that result in a variable called B. Um, because I am measuring a qubit that is in superposition, it will basically decide, based on these probabilities, if it will collapse to either 0 or 1, which is a 50-50 thing. So I could do, like, uh, a message uh, B which will write the state of B to the console, and B is like zero or one, because that's the result of a measurement, it's always zero or one. And if I run this application, it will take some time to compile. Um, it doesn't even run. Let me see very quickly, did I make a mistake? Not sure. Oh, I just mistyped .NET. .NET run. It will show one or zero, and if I run it multiple times, it will sometimes show one, it will sometimes show zero. And if I run it an infinite amount of times, it will be a perfect 50, 50%. Um, sometimes it will be one, sometimes it will be zero. So that's, that's what Q-sharp uh, basically um, is all about. So let's go back to my slides. So before I show you a real quantum algorithm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Azure Quantum. So, as I told you before, Microsoft started with Q-sharp as a programming language, and in the background, they are also working on creating their own physical quantum computer. But that is not ready yet. But they also, they all already have the programming language. Um, why? Because that gives us the opportunity to already learn about um, quantum computing. You need to dig a little bit into the, the, the theory. You need to dig a little bit into the mathematics to understand, but then you can use Q-sharp um, and you can just try out a couple of things. Q-sharp also has uh, helpful debugging tools because you're running a simulation. You're not really measuring a qubit. So basically you can debug a qubit that is in superposition um, because you're simulating. So you can, for example, see those alpha and beta values, and you can try to change those values. And, you, and in this way, you can learn about quantum. In the real world, when you're running your quantum program on a real quantum computer, you cannot debug. Because once you are looking at the state of your qubit, it will collapse and it will be zero or one. And then you lose your quantum superposition. So you're not able to do that on a real quantum computer. So that's already a cool thing about a programming language like Q-sharp. Um, the second thing is Microsoft is already working with some partners, uh, partners, companies that already have um, quantum hardware that is available. For example, QCI. Uh, QCI is a company which has a superconducting quantum computer available. Superconducting is just a, a very specific way of hardware um, to make quantum computing work. Um, IBM, for example, is also working with superconducting uh, quantum computers. I think they are using um, electrons and microwaves um, to make everything work on a, on a hardware level. But they are, they are also partnering with IonQ and Honeywell, which are two separate companies that are creating um, quantum hardware, which is using ion traps. So they're not using electrons, they're using ions and laser beams to, to do stuff with those qubits. And then Microsoft themselves, they are still working on their own um, quantum computing computer, which is something uh, different even, they use a topological approach. Um, and with Azure Quantum, Microsoft actually tries to 
um, give us access to this hardware in a in a very gener general way, in like a universal way. So we just need to write some Q sharp code. We need to push that Q sharp code to Azure Quantum, and we need to make a decision with which of these hardware vendors uh, we want to work together. And that can be based on the power of their quantum computers, the location of their quantum computers, the costs that they uh, like, the charges that they that they ask for their quantum computers. We can make that decision, and Q Sharp will run on all of them. And the idea behind this is the same as what .NET and Java are actually doing. So we are creating programs in Java or in C Sharp, they are compiled down to like an intermediate language, uh, which is not machine code, but that intermediate language is actually being um, compiled at runtime for the platform you're running your application on. And with quantum computing and Q Sharp, we're going to do the same thing. Your Q Sharp will be comp compiled to some kind of intermediate language. And in uh, the Q Sharp world, this is being called Queer of quantum intermediate representation. And then the hardware vendor like QCI, IronQ, and Microsoft, they need to write a runtime that is able to convert that quantum intermediate representation into actual machine code that works for their hardware. And their hardware will then just do what our um, quantum algorithm does. So when we put a qubit through the H gate, we want to put it in superposition. Quantum intermediate representation will have this. Um, step in our process, put that qubit into superposition, and then the hardware vendor will translate that into the, the, the physical operation that is necessary to put uh, the property of whatever um, element that they are using into a state of superposition. So that's the idea behind Azure Quantum. Azure Quantum is not yet available today. Um, it is available in limited preview. Um, I am I have access to this limited preview, so I can play around with it. Um, and that's why I can explain um, this kind of thing to you, but I'm not allowed to show it to you yet because it's not yet um, uh, mature enough to be uh, shown into like a public preview. Um, but yeah, we expect somewhere in the near future that Microsoft will put Azure Quantum into like a public preview, and then we will be able to try to simulate Q Sharp on our local environment, but also push our Q Sharp programs to the Azure cloud and make it, let it run on an actual quantum computer. And I already tried this today. I can run very simple Q Sharp applications on a physical quantum computer, uh, which is very cool. Um, so let's show you a little bit of entanglement and maybe um, let's take a, 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 the next step already and talk about uh, teleportation. So entanglement, I already told you, if we have two uh, qubits or two quantum objects uh, and, and, and they are in superposition, they can be entangled, which means if you observe one of them, the other one will immediately get the opposite value. In quantum computing, um, we build like an abstraction on top of that that says if you put your two qubits through the, this circuit, which means if you have two qubits, put one qubit through the Hadamard gate, and then use a C not gate. This, this is a gate I've not yet talked about, but it's kind of a, a not gate with an if um, attached to it, which means if the bottom qubit is one, flip the top qubit from one to zero or zero to one. Um, but the bottom qubit is in superposition, which means that it's not zero, it's not one. But here we have an if, an if that says, if the bottom one is one, flip the top one. Um, and this is actually the circuit that is able to create this entangled state because now the bottom one is in superposition. The top one is actually also in superposition because it's entangled to the bottom one. And it doesn't really matter, but if you observe one of them, the top one or, or the bottom one, that doesn't matter, um, they will both immediately collapse at the same time. And if the one you measured is one, the other one is also going to be one. And if you measure zero, the, also, the other one is also going to be zero. So in real life, in the physical implement, in the physical nature, they will have the opposite state in quantum computing, they will have the same state. So it's a very important um, concept there. Now, thanks to this, um, this concept of uh, entanglement, we can do something that is called teleportation. And teleportation is quite cool in, in quantum computing. This is a complete circuit, uh, which only uses the Hadamard gate that we already know. Uh, it uses the C not gate, which I just talked about 
uh, a minute ago. And we have uh, an X and a Z gate. An X gate will just flip your vector in the block sphere around the X axis, and the Z gate will flip it around the Z axis for like 180 degrees. Um, the idea behind this teleportation circuit is that um, it's a solution to a problem in quantum computing that you are not able to copy values from one qubit to another qubit or values or state. For example, if you have a, a Q message, which is a, which is a qubit that has some kind of message state, um, it's in superposition, for example. It's not zero, it's not one, it's somewhere in between. Um, it's in superposition. You are not able to copy that state onto another qubit. Something like that does not exist in the quantum world. Just there's no way of, of doing that. Teleportation is a solution to, to that um, by using entanglement. So Alice and Bob, they are two people and they want to communicate that message from Alice to Bob. They don't need to be in the uh, same location. What they need to do is they need to take two qubits and they need to entangle them. So that's the first step. That's what you can see right here. Um, so Alice puts her qubit through the Hadamard gate and then combines it with Bob's qubit using the C0 gate. And now these two qubits are entangled. They're in superposition and entangled. Now Alice has a message qubit which contains a complex state, complex state. Um, and she wants to teleport that message to Bob because Alice, for some reason, stays at home and Bob takes the airplane to the other side of the world and he takes his entangled qubit with him. And now Alice wants to uh, teleport her message to his qubit. That's the idea. What Alice does is she does some additional entanglement with the message. So she also entangles the message to her qubit, which is already entangled with Bob. And this is the way you should do that. Um, first the C-naught gate and then the Hadamard gate. And now we have a three qubit entangled uh, state. And now something very weird happens. Um, Alice basically measures her own qubit, which is in a state of superposition and is entangled with both the message and Bob's qubit. She measures that um, and it will result in a one or a zero based on that probability. The probability in this case will be um, dependent on the fact that it's in superposition and on the fact that it's being entangled with the message. So if it results in one, and only when it results in one, she will pick up the phone, she will call to Bob and she will tell Bob, Bob, your entangled qubit, you need to put it through an X gate. And will Bob will do that. If her qubit collapsed to zero, she, she doesn't need to do anything. Then Alice does a second thing. She looks at the message and she, she measures the message. So the message will also collapse to either zero or one and it will lose its original state. So it's, it's lost, it's gone. Um, if it's a one, she picks up the phone again and she talks to Bob and she says, the message collapsed to one, so you need to put your qubit through the Z gate. And Bob does that, or it doesn't do that if, if, if it's not necessary, if it, uh, the message collapsed to zero. And for some reason, with some magic, um, the complex state of that message is now teleported to Bob's this qubit because Bob just did those two operations. So Bob started out with a zero qubit, like in a zero state, was not in superposition, but because it was entangled with Alice's qubit and the message qubit, the message qubit is now teleported to Bob's qubit. So now we have teleported complex information from one qubit to another. And the reason we call it teleporting and not copying is because the original qubit is lost. It has been collapsed to either zero or one. The original message is lost. And if you think about like science fiction teleportation, it's the same thing. If you teleport a person from one location to another, the original person is lost. It just disappears or it dies. We don't really know how to teleport a person, uh, but you can, you can see it in your head. The, the original one disappears and it will emerge in the new location. That's what teleportation is all about. Um, so it's not copying, it's just changing. Um, location in this case. So that's the idea. Um, if I show you this in Q sharp, it looks like this. So if we want to teleport a qubit, we use uh, a message qubit as a parameter in our function. So this contains the message and I can actually, for example, uh, let's see. Here, I'm starting out with a message qubit and I'm just going to choose a very complex superposition state. I'm not going to do 50-50. I'm going to do pi, 2 pi over 3 
rotation around the y axis, which is like the 120 degrees, which is a 75% chance and a 25% chance um, division. So this is my message. And then on top of that message, I, I mean, um, we are going to also allocate two extra qubits, one for Alice and one for Bob. Because we are running this in a simulated environment, um, Q Sharp has, has some uh, diagnostics functions that are able to dump the state of a qubit into a text file. And then you can really see the mathematical representation of, of these uh, states. And now I'm just implementing that um, like visual circuit that I show you er shown you earlier. So we put Alice's qubit in superposition and we entangle it with Bob's qubit. Then we entangle Bob's qubit, uh, I'm sorry, Alice's qubit with the message qubit. And then Alice measures her own qubit. If the result of that measurement equals one, we put Bob's qubit through the X gate. We measure the message's qubit, collapsing that state, um, uh, losing the message. If it um, if it's, uh, collapses to one, we call Bob and we put Bob's qubit through the Z gate. Now, the message state has been magically teleported to Bob state, and I do another dump register to dump the, the, the qubit state into these text files, and we, we, we can actually see that the state has been teleported. Um, and in, in the end, you always have to reset your qubits in Q Sharp for some reason. Uh, Q Sharp always need to end, needs to end your application with all qubits in state zero for some reason. So you need to do this for yourself right now. But here on the left-hand side, you can actually see those uh, states. So you can see that the message before, this is the um, mathematical representation of that state. You can see that um, the zero state has the alpha value for zero and the beta value for one. No, actually this is, I'm sorry, this is the complex number. This is the alpha value complex number. This is the beta value complex number. So it's one over two times the zero state and square root over three over uh, square root of three over two um, for the beta state. If you calculate that into probabilities, which is also what happens here, you have a 25% chance of collapsing to zero and a 75% chance of collapsing to one. So this is like a debug of your actual quantum state, something that you are not able to do on a, on a real life quantum computer. This is a visual representation, by the way. This is less than this, this is 75, this is 25. Now, if you look at the message states afterwards, you can see that it has collapsed to zero. So it, it loses its, its uh, original complex superposition state. It's now 100% um, in the zero state. But if you look at Bob's qubit before, it was also in a zero state. And then after the teleportation circuit, it is actually in, a, in the same state as our initial message state. So this is teleportation. Um, um, simulated on your own local PC. But if you push this uh, quantum program to Azure Quantum, um, you are not able to show those states, but you are actually, um, you actually end up with another qubit that has the same state as um, your original message qubit beforehand. And for some algorithms, that is actually uh, something that you need. Uh, so very cool. And with that, um, I'm at the end of my presentation. I'm just going to show you one more thing. This is on my GitHub. Um, and this is also something very helpful if you're trying to learn about quantum computing. This um, is called the CHSH game. Um, this is a quantum algorithm that will show you that there's like a hypothetical, ga hypothetical game that can be played by two people, where in the classical world, they have a 75% chance of winning which is a, a very good chance of winning, of course, uh, but it's a hypothetical game. So if you play this game, if you read about this game and you play that, that game, you have a 75% chance of winning the game. If you play the same game by using quantum, you can actually work together with uh, the, the other person that's playing the game with you and increase the chances of winning to 85% um, by just using quantum and uh, and uh, entanglement. It's a very, very interesting concept. This has no real life um, uh, usefulness. The only uh, implication that it has is that it shows you that in the classical world, on a classical computer, you have a 75% chance uh, of success. And in a quantum computing world, you have an 85% chance, uh, an 85% uh, luck 
um, which is higher than 75, which means that quantum computing is, can actually gives, uh, give us better results than a classical computer. Um, it is quite complex um, the first time you look at it, but you really have to have to um, dig deep, look at the Q-sharp, look at the theory, um, and it will make sense to you. So basically, we're, we're playing a game uh, th 10,000 of times, and we're playing the game both uh, classically and quantum. And then we're just checking um, if we won or if we if we lost. And then at the end, we're doing a message to the console. Classical win per percentage will be 75, and then quantum win percentage will be 85. Very cool. My slides also contain um, the visualization of this problem. And with this, I just want to show you that it uses a little bit of linear algebra, a little bit of uh, mathematics to explain where these probabilities come from. And you can you can here see that this 0.85 is actually your 85% chance of, of winning the game. I don't have time to discuss all of this right now, but I really want to encourage you, if you are interested in quantum computing, really look at these kinds of examples. Um, these are existing algorithms that are be, that, that are invented by um, like uh, computer scientists or mathematicians in the uh, in the in the 90s like in the 1990s um, that are actually very valuable um, and that, that tell us that quantum computing can actually help us in the future. The only hurdle we still have today is creating the physical hardware that is powerful enough to run it on problems that are big um, because we can only run like these kinds of things. They are very small. You can also run them on a classical computer um, because the problems in itself are small enough. But if we want to run this for like a very large problem uh, scope, we, we just don't have the, the, the quantum hardware that is powerful enough. So hopefully in the next few decades, um, we can actually reach uh, quantum supremacy as they, as they call it. We can have quantum hardware that is able to, to, do, the, to do this um, quick enough for very large problems. And with that, I would say thank you. Um, and I'm going to have a look at the, the questions that are still there. Um, and uh, I, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. So let's see. I have one question. Can you share a list of resources that were useful to get you to get uh, the required background to understand complex quantum programs? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so let me, if you contact me on, if you contact me on Slack later today, um, I will be more than happy to share you all the links that I can think of. Um, I'm not going to do it right now, uh, but again, my name is Johnny Hoybergs. Um, you can just see my speaker name in the in the agenda. Just uh, give me a message on Slack, um, and I will be happy to share everything that I know uh, with you. Any more questions? I'm also looking at the chat in WebEx. Okay. No questions. Again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your conference. And I'll be, I'll be uh, on my computer the whole day. I will be available on Slack the whole day.